<laughs> Lord, yeah, that's that's in the category of busted. <laughs> Dennis, welcome Hello. to our one hundred episode spectacular oh moonstructacular. The moonstructular. There's a moon so. like a pizza pie in the morning. Yes. That's, that's right. The opening tune. And could it, is there any other tune that could possibly have no. been the opening tune? No. No. For sure. No. Here's something that will amaze you. Amaze me. Let me put it that way, because I don't know what amaze you or not. But last night, as I was channel surfing, waiting for the Michigan State game, I came upon the tune that made the Bee Gees world famous, which is Saturday Night Fever mm -hmm. with John Travolta. Mm -hmm. So I switched between the game was not started. I went back and forth a couple of times, and I was in this particular section where I met John Travolta's mother and noted that she was a, a, a big part of Moonstruck. And then a little while later, his dancing partner came and I realized that she too is a character in Moonstruck. Who would have thought that in the span of five minutes, the movie Saturday Night Live corresponded with two of those stars? Saturday Night Fever. Saturday Night Fever, yes. <laughs> and well, it was I'm interesting curious. too, because the Bee Gees tunes for that movie mm -hmm were all being prepared by them for just because they knew they were going to be doing a record. And while they were out in the country building up this base of five songs that formed the core of that movie, they got a call and the guy said, hey, we're doing this movie, disco, John Travolta, blah, blah, blah. And the Gibb brothers said, oh, shit, we've been working on some stuff. So, yeah, we can give it a shot. And they were like, within a week, the producers the, for the movie received a cassette tape with all of the songs from that movie out of all of which became worldwide bestsellers that wow. were all ready pre-cut. And it's quite a documentary about the Gibbs Brothers, by the way. It was uh, quite moving for me, but I love the music. It's being redone now with, with Cowboy, a Nashville sound to it, <laughs> because Barry Gibbs has said, you know what? I'm not held back by anything right now. And he's doing these tunes with Dolly Parton and doing shit on the Grand Ole Opry. That is a whole nother reach of this music that he did. It was never intended for disco right. in particular, it was just at all. It's just good music um, that fit into the to the popular times. Not only right time and right place, but the opening tune in Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night Live. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday Night Fever. Fever from he, Saturday he Night. About, and he was on. He wrote the song when he was on the road in a car, and they were going on one of those roads that went. He went over the top of the asphalt and went. Because every time you hit a, yep. a particular yep. crack. And that's what he used for the opening. And so now knowing that, when they open that up and they show a train, it's all silent before there's any music. Huh. It's just scenes of, of, New York, of New York City. And, and then there's a train, and then the train goes into that tune. All of that in nice. an intro, I tell you, to the big event of the night. Or as they say in French, entro. 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 So what are your preliminary remarks about the movie Moonstruck? So when you mentioned Saturday Night Fever... I quickly looked up and recognized from my perusings of the Moonstruck IMDb that you must have been talking about Julie Bovasio as the actress that was in both. I imagine it was two. his mother. I can't immediately recognize who the second one is. But so my opening, first of all, uh, great opening song and opening opening credits. The very first note that I wrote down was that the opera that they are that they are preparing for is La Boheme, which is the one of two operas that I've ever seen performed. One was Triviata, in, I, and I saw that in Budapest because I was in Budapest, and I. That's quite the that's quite the uh, scenario there. Well, well hold on. The world. Yeah, I was in Budapest, just tripping in for a little bit of business for the for, for, for the, for the opera. Yes, no, th that's actually my warm up brag. But I was in Budapest when I was like twenty one years old, and and the price of the opera tickets were so low that for twenty bucks we could get amazing opera tickets like the the nosebleed seats for the opera were like less than a dollar and this is because the the currency was just yeah. in, in tatters so i saw that and it had yeah so maybe this is my problem with opera so it was of course in italian 
And sometimes in the opera theater, or I guess most of the time, they will put up subtitles on the screen somewhere projected. But the subtitles were in Hungarian. I think maybe... This is a, this is a good news, bad news story, isn't it? <laughs> so I think maybe there was one screen somewhere far off that had them in English, but I can't recall exactly. Yeah. So anyway, that was my first experience with opera. And it was okay. It's pretty. Nope. I'm wrong. And then when I was in, so I've actually seen three operas. When I was in England, I saw Carmen, a famous Spanish opera. And that was nice because it was in Spanish and I could more or less understand Spanish. And I guess I was too far away to see such subtitles. But so when I saw La Boheme, I saw that in the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. <laughs> <clears throat> While well, on this too trip, much. you're and, too much. There's and, a short story in there somewhere in there, and that could uh, be the title of it. The problem there was that the opera was in Italian and the subtitles were in Russian, <laughs> and my wife and Once I again, did not understand a goddamn thing. Like, we, if they were speaking Italian. With our knowledge of Spanish, you can you more or less pick up 75% yeah. or whatever. Uh, but singing Italian, uh, right. forget about it, as they say. Uh, so, forget about it. Yeah. So, right. so, 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 so I'm then, familiar with the, with the, um, with the plot. And, and, so you, and so I was not spoiled when at the end of the movie they said, oh, I can't believe that the lead character died or whatever. And I was like, yeah, I actually knew that because I've been to the Bolshoi Theater in uh, – must go when I saw that. Yes. So when you noted that when you were opening this opening scenes of, yes, um, this might be a seven-hour episode. That's all right. I got seven hours. Oh, and then Lord. my next note was that I. That and so what's the analogy between the La Boheme and the movie Moonstruck? So La Boheme is a story of, as I understood it, of some actor theater nerd types. Imagine that someone writing a play about theater nerds but it's an unrequited love yes and there's it's like uh three dudes and a, and a girl that are sharing an apartment and there's this love rhombus that occurs and love rhombus <laughs> <laughs> and, oh. and of course which leads to nothing but misery for all all four people but of course uh, is the in, in one sense the perspective of the movie itself thus the uh juxtaposition of the particular opera they were going after in the script of the of this of the screenplay was was a stroke it was a good stroke of genius eh i think you're reading too much into it i think it was just no i don't at all i don't at all one of the most moving scenes in the entire thing was when Cher, who'd never shares character uh what's her name loretta how could you forget that get back loretta never seen and she didn't understand the thing that was going on and she just cried and cried and the scene that was happening was unrequited love Right. And that's when that was the pinnacle point in the emotional life of the script, when it led to her final decision that she was not going to make a mistake. It was not going to be this terrible thing of the man she didn't love, that she was going to go with the wolf. Mm, indeed. And very wolfy hairdo. Anyway, yes, meh, unrequited. That's not what unrequited, as I say, love really means. It's not that you choose the wrong person and it means that the person that you're doing it doesn't, doesn't return it. There you go. But that is the story of who the tragic figure in the movie is Loretta's what's it, what's her husband's or to be husband or fiance who goes to Italy. Yes. My it, mother's going to die. Ronnie. No, Ronnie is the wolf. Uh, Johnny oh, Camareri. Right. Johnny. Johnny Camareri. Yeah. <laughs> and hold on. I, I, after the the twelfth time that I heard his name pronounced, I said, "That sounds a lot like Johnny Come Lately." Johnny Come Lately. Johnny Maybe is that what it means in Italian? Johnny Come Lately, which is not under not a he total just died. stretch. That actor just died. Yeah, a couple years ago. Yep, I remember. Anyway, it's in a perfectly cast. Hold on, isn't I, the movie perfectly cast? I'm, I'm, I'm working through my notes. Oh, your notes. Oh, yeah, we just got, got through the opening credits. Oh, and we're not even through <laughs> the opening credits because. The, ne the next note that I wrote down, because I'm 13, was that the music was composed by Dick Hyman, which I thought that's pretty dumb. Yeah, um, you'd think you'd go by Richard, wouldn't you? Yeah, exactly. Richard Hyman. Yeah, so I, I just rewatched most of it. I, I watched it one time last week all the way through and took notes, and then I watched it again. And Okay, so the casting. Yes, all the characters are great. I... I have to admit, I've never really liked Cher. Oh. Ever. Really? Like, I guess some of her stuff with Sonny is okay, but 
I, oh, you mean her music? You don't mean her, her music and, her, and well, everything. Um, and her? <laughs> yeah, and her. She's. Poor I woman, how to cheer in your wrath? I don't find her particularly attractive, even in what this must be peak share attractiveness. Yeah. So it's not, and I can see that, oh, she's as attractive as she can possibly be, but meh, I don't, it's not warming my cockles. But the, uh, I don't know, I guess 20 years ago when she came out with that horrible, strong enough, do you believe in life after love thing that was so like auto-tuned and yeah, gross. Which was controversial. And got played every fucking where. Yeah. And I got so tired of that song that I just developed a distaste for her as an individual. For sure. Yeah. So a, a further distaste. Further I I, I was ambivalent before, but now I'm actually um actively actively a- negative. Well, that explains why it took so long to see the fucking movie. I always wondered about that. That does explain it, absolutely. But anyway, so what's your impression of- now? Uh, I can totally see why and how the movie is a cult classic. It is a... Well, it's not a cult classic. I won the Academy Award for Best Picture. True. It's... And now you can no, say that it has a cult following. Uh, it's I, not a cult picture. I'd like to it's correct, mainstream. I'd like to correct you on that. I did some research. It was nominated for Best Picture. Ah. It was not... And it won Best Actress for My Beloved sure. Chair. And Best Supporting what Actress for... Olivia Dukakis, Olivia Dukakis yes. who is amazing. She is way yes. more attractive than Cher, in my opinion. For, she's 89, and I'm it sure also won Best Original funny. Screenplay. But it was very good. I, I loved, I was surprised when I saw John Mahoney in it. I was like, hey, that's the dad from Frasier. He's the womanizer guy in the restaurant. Oh, yeah. And cur- an absolutely unmistakable wasp in the heart of an Italian story. Yes, yes. And it reminded me of the, of the in my big Greek wedding, the mother and father of the groom who were introduced to the Greek family in the Greek culture. Yes. It was the same type of, oh my, what have I gotten myself into kind of thing. And he had this famous, he had this catchphrase that he, he would yeah. say all the time yeah. of, would you do away with her dinner? Any evidence of her and bring me a glass, a big glass of vodka. Right. <laughs> like, nice. He said that three times. He was very confident and sure of himself in a way, which was very odd because with her as a unmistakable presence of a woman who knows about men and how dowdy they made sure her character looked wearing a babushka uh, a scarf anyway and uh, in a particularly drab raincoat and in other parts of the movie she didn't they didn't make her look that drab at all Although yeah of course they but they clearly were going for a the common movie trope of let's make this person let's in, intentionally make this person look less attractive and then when we actually make them look attractive it's a bigger switch right it's like when a little nerdy girl takes off her glasses backwards. and does her hair and then it's like oh wow right. she's pretty yeah the first scene i guess maybe at the restaurant where johnny is trying to propose <laughs> like that was when i really got that this was a like absurd comedy where he was like he was, he got so nervous. Scratch, he got so nervous. He was scratching his head, his head and he, and it's dude, what are you doing? You're about to propose. He, and he says, my scalp's not getting enough blood sometimes. And then immediately he goes into, Hey, would you marry me? <laughs> it's just like the, the most doltish possible yeah. proposal. Or when he went in that same scene, when he's laughing at the woman who's yelling at the, it's the introduction yep. of the character you, you just mentioned, the professor, how he chuckles and he says, and she says, what's funny. And he line. says, a woman who can't control, no. a man who cannot control his woman is funny. You nailed it. That's exactly and, the line. And, and that's when you know that the seeds are, the seeds are planted with her. I, I just, I've seen it so many times that the, the other thing I love about the screenplay is that the rapidity of the scenery, it goes from one good scene to another good scene. Yeah. That movies, it's always moving. There's one slow thing when she's in front of the fireplace and she's being yep. romantic and you realize that's probably the first time this poor de- deprived woman has ever done anything like that. And how deserved she is for this true love, which when you go, when you get into the, into her apartment, into his apartment, once again, you see the poster for the movie La Boheme. And she is, that is where she is telling him the story about how he's a wolf. You're a wolf. Yeah. She says, give me some whiskey. And yeah, whiskey hold, on, I, I, hold on. I wrote that. I wrote some of that down. And, but you go back to the original restaurant scene where he proposes and, and she says, you need to be on the floor kneeling. Okay. And he says, this is a good suit. And then he kneels down and, and the waiter says, what's he doing? That's going to ruin his suit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and then the, the John Mahoney character says, is that man praying? <laughs> <laughs> Just so good. 
And what's interesting about the the whole vibe is everything is neighborhood. So yeah. we're in a restaurant and, and Johnny finally proposes and she says, yes, Johnny Camperere, I will agree to be your wife. I will marry you. Yes, I will. Right. And everybody bursts into applause in the restaurant. Because they all know everybody. Yep. They all know everybody and they've been waiting for Johnny to do this for years. And Loretta, my mother, it's a miracle. She's not dying, Loretta. You know, one, the, the scene immediately following that, which could have been a throwaway scene, but it's actually really important to the to holding everything together, is she goes, I guess it's right from the restaurant, but she goes home to tell her folks that she's getting married, but she stops off at the liquor store first. And there she's going to go pick up a bottle of wine or something. And the husband and wife that run the liquor store are fighting with each other. And the wife says, you're a wolf. I know a wolf when I've seen one. Oh, and yes. that introduces the concept of the wolf. Yes. And he's, I'm not a wolf. Yes, wolves everywhere. So every man is a wolf. Yeah, we're a wolf. Uh-huh. And then, but then the actual inflection point that hints to the rest of the movie is is he says something like, you know what I see when I look at you? And everyone's expecting a big insult. And he says, I see the pretty girl I married or whatever. And that yeah, just right. t- totally deflates the argument. And they're like, right. and they're like all ro- romantic lovey-dovey. And, and she smiles a little bit as she And, and Loretta, Loretta thinks about catches this it. and catches that, oh, you can love a wolf, I guess. <laughs> but, but going from where she works to where she's going, the, the undertaker who she took care of, who soiled his tie. And how he was talking about how he's making money. And, and <laughs> she's a bookkeeper for him. It's early. Yeah, yeah, that's the very first scene, yeah. Yeah, and she goes from that business to another business, but it's all in the neighborhood. Exactly. It's all in the neighborhood. And then the great pops with the dogs. A bad okay. moon. Okay, John, so, hey, John. so then, she gets, then she gets home and she wakes up her, her poor father, Cosmo. Cosmo is a great name. I, I love the name Cosmo. And she says, uh, hey, pops, are you sleeping? He says, I can't sleep anymore. It's too much like death. <laughs> Jello. <laughs> and oh, then she, she tells character. him, she tells him, and, and they go, they go wake up the mother, Olivia Dukakis, Olympia Dukakis. And, <laughs> and she immediately wakes up, says, Who's, who died? And she says, she nah. opens her eyes, right? Yeah. L- is getting married. Opening. Who died? Yeah. And she, she, she's, okay, first of all, before they even go to, to tell her, her father Cosmo says, don't get married, Loretta. It don't work out for you. <laughs> Just, right. What a great parental <laughs> thing to say to your child. Right. Who's going to pay for it? You are. Yeah, and I don't and, I got no money. You got more money than Rockefeller. She says, "You're rich as Roosevelt. You're just cheap, oh, which Cosmo." Is Roosevelt. <laughs> but no, then is Roosevelt. What a dry, funny character Olivia Dukakis yes, has. What's her name is. in the movie? I don't uh, recall. But her, it, I love the line where also when they're there in the bedroom and and she grabs Loretta and says, uh, "Do you love him?" And she says, "No." She says, "Good," because if you love him, they'll drive you crazy. Yeah. Do, do you like Olivia him? And like she says, "Yeah, he's an okay." Yeah. She says, perfect. This is the perfect husband. <laughs> it's it's well constructed. The bit that I and, and my wife have a lot of fun with is when she's she eats part of her breakfast, which is pasta uh, for breakfast, and uh, and a drink of whiskey. And then she calls him about the wolf. And that's when he grabs her and kisses her. And she hold on, slaps hold on, him. hold on. That's not, you're, that's not pasta. She made him breakfast? steak. Yes. But let's, let, hold on. Let's let's savor the moment here. So as I'm writing these notes, then we have the scene where these old men, the guy with dogs, go and gather around this grave and just talk shit in Italian to each other about something, nothing really. No, uh, it was about a woman getting married, a woman who should get married. Well, well, I mean, somebody's there was, daughter. There was some talk. Yeah, it was just. But I love this idea of because I see that all over town in Spain where I live, where old men will just sit on a bench. Uh, and just talk about talk. shit. So then Johnny flies off, and I love how the old lady at the airport is, I put a curse on that flight, <laughs> and is so adamant about it, and tell says... Him, uh, tell him, tell share. Yeah, tell, yeah, right, yeah, right. tell him, Loretta, which, I put a curse on that flight. Loretta, oh, your, is... your fiance's on that flight? Whatever, my sister's on that flight, and, and fuck with her, <laughs> and I put a curse on that. And then Loretta says... Loretta, who's just been talking about all her bad luck in her marriage, right. comes back and says, I don't believe in curses. And the lady says, yeah, neither do I. <laughs> and didn't she run into some nuns? The yeah, then she bumped into some nuns, yeah. That was just, wow. That's always a foreboding of a, a tragic prevent Is nuns it? in the picture. So then he calls, uh, and he does this thing when he's not sure that she can hear him. He does this just like, maybe that's how... Maybe that's like how Italians test microphones. Like we say, test one, two, three. And in Spain, what is it that they say? In Spain, they do they do something like that. They do like, 
when you're testing a microphone with a PI system or whatever to see. He does that on the phone? He does that on the phone when they can't hear. And she says, how was the plane ride? He says, the waitresses were very nice. (laughs) So that was hilarious. And she says, don't stand directly under the sun. You got a hat. Use your hat. (laughs) And she's just treating him like a child. And then he hangs up the phone and his mother is wailing. And then he starts wailing and walks into the room. And what her dad says about him. Well, and her mama's boy. And, and her, her mother says, how's the mother? And, and she says, she's dying, but I can still hear her big mouth. <laughs> Just so good. Lord. And the, then, scenes in the, the scenes in the kitchen were all remarkable. Yes, the kitchen is a primary place. And so then she goes and she contacts Ronnie. And wow, Nicolas Cage with the big hairy chest. Yeah, skinny. Um, skinny. Just, was, this was the second, his second big movie. You know what his first one was? Not the Conan, Conan Brothers one. No. Yes. Raising Arizona. Yes. Yes. He's got that, that hair still. He's that right after hair. that. It's right yeah. after that. And that was his first big, unmistakable, and, and similar kind of character. Yeah, it, it's hardly acting. I don't know if that's means okay. that's the way he is, but I get you. Yeah. So my my other note around this time is Nicholas Cage is not that attractive either. Like, he, he doesn't... No, yeah. he's a raw, he's a raw, he's a, the only, one of the, one of the, one of the ways that his uh, character is defined is by the fact that the woman who works for him loves him. Yes. Adores him. And she acted and, the shit out of that. Oh yeah. Just absolutely. Who, name me one character in the entire movie who didn't act the shit. T- name me one actor where whatever they did or said was disappointing you. Exactly. And that actress, Nada Despovicic, uh, she, she was in Jerry Maguire, but she hasn't been in. No, she hasn't been in all that many. So, things. Anyway. do you remember? Do you remember uh, Cosmo's girlfriend? Of course. Okay, so look her up in the in your little if you got it open right now. Who's I that do. actress? Anita Gillette. Okay, now I want you to go to Saturday Night Fever and find the same actress who plays who plays John Travolta's first dance partner. I believe you are mistaken on this, my friend. Oh, I don't think so. Uh, because she is not listed oh. on Saturday Night Fever. If you know the name of the character, I know Flo is the mother. I, I I was actually feeling a little soft on it anyway. I, usually okay. I can nail these these. But you are often better than the internet on these things. But uh, with... it was a stretch. But I will tell you this though, and this isn't worth your time. But you can go, you can put pictures of these two women and tell me if the woman who star who was the girlfriend in Moonstruck that the John Travolta character, which was filmed so many years earlier, and this woman looked like you would think right. this woman would look like 20 years ago. Sure. I, I will give you that. Because that's kind of where... But yeah, that, that act, she, as we said, they all did a great job. And that particular character was very interesting. And so I liked, I thought it was clever how Nick Cage does his whole, this is why I'm angry at my brother rant which Loretta... I about. lost my hand! I lost my bride, he says. And he holds I up. lost my bride! I lost which, is, my... which is bordering on overacting, but it goes so far that it's like it's, comedy. He's, this is the thing about these people. They're all what we know in our life. They're characters. Yeah. We know people who act eccentric or larger than life or whatever adjective you want to use to describe them. And he's one of those. Dramatic. He's obviously over the top because he got his he cut his hand off. Right. <laughs> and it's like, all right, that's enough to make anybody half fucking crazy. <laughs> but I make the scene I love that every time I see it, it just reminds me what a great fucking piece of acting it is when he's talking about the bread and throwing yeah. the bread in the bass. I make bread all day. <laughs> that feeds pe- <laughs> bread is life. They say. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I thought it was a clever decision to have him have this wooden prosthetic that right. was shaped like a hand leather and yeah wood. so that so well he kept calling it wood so that you didn't need any special effects it was right. just a, a glove that he could slip his hand into which Easy was enough. a clever enough. and actually quite unremarkable is this character of all you'd be you'd never noticed anymore that he only had one hand that the was, scenes and the it wasn't prominent a lot in the theater he had his hands in his pockets and when he was sitting with his hands in his lap and the, and the, the go ahead. then they one scene that could have totally been thrown away, but I love that they didn't, was because it doesn't really serve the rest of the movie, was this scene of Cosmo selling 
plumbing to this young couple in an apartment. And he says, and I wrote this down, he says, there are three kinds of pipe. You ha- the kind you have, which is garbage. And then there's bronze, which is fine unless something goes wrong and something always goes wrong. And then there's copper. It costs money because it saves money. And it's just such pure salesmanship. Right. Uh, All I, you know what it was establishing? That he was conniving rich, but the couple there, <laughs> obviously a second gr- a couple of wasps right. who were gentrifying in an Italian an old Never, Italian yeah, neighborhood. Yes. And he's got him, he's got him by the short ears. But it provided the reason why he was so confident and cocky. Yes. As to think that he's gonna have a girlfriend and buy her diamonds and just because he's so arrogant and well, thinking that he's above it all and that you needed to know he was the king of fucking plumbing. Now I have a a, a cousin of my father in law who's a plumber who is a multimillionaire because he opened a plumbing business. Wow. And so that's I'm hip to all that. They wanted to establish that clearly. That brownstone, by the way, just sold that they live in huh. for six million dollars. Huh. It was one of the more visited places in in where was this? So uh, Bronx? No. In Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yeah, shit, with our Patreon money at patreon.com slash happy hour, we should have put a bid in on that. <laughs> Damn. A uh, hundred episodes. Holy Christ. <laughs> yeah. So what I, but what I noticed on my second viewing is that at the time you see that and then you see him bragging about it. Bragging but, about what? Bragging about how he tricked this couple into buying yeah. the, the expensive copper pipes. You, We hadn't seen his girlfriend yet. And you see him bragging about it to someone who is behind a column off screen. And then when he's so proud about it, then we, this is the first time we see his girlfriend and she's impressed. She said, Oh, Cosmo, you're so good at selling shit. And, and then he whips out a little bracelet that he gives to her right. with it. it he, right. he says, there's little birds and stars, birds fly to the stars, I guess. And just smiles. And she's just, Oh, Cosmo. Ah, anyway. And, and she says to him, the things you say, <laughs> he waves his fingers like this. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which for our listeners, I'm- Sure, they can imagine it. Yes, they. Yeah, and then we cut back. Like we immediately cut. Back. That was an interstitial between when when Nick told Cher come up to my apartment, and then we cut to that, and then we cut back to them in their apartment. And for some reason, she's like preparing him coffee and cooking for him and shit. Like because it's just a thing that he is he has gone off in the basement and shown himself to be hateful and crazy about his brother. And, so, and she realizes that this is going to be her family. So prior to any of the wolf story, she thought she has promised her, she promised Johnny that she would get him to come to the wedding. And she realized that in order to do that, she had to get him out of that environment and tr- do what a woman does. Right. Take care of a man and get him to think straight. So she makes some coffee. You haven't eaten, kicks, cooks a steak that's so rare right. as he a premonition it. to the wolf. <laughs> and he eats it and he's sweating and he's famished. And, and then he starts to talk and she says, shit, he's off his rocker with this stuff. And she says, and she throws her fork down and she says, you got any whiskey? Give me some whiskey because she's got to tell him. I wrote that down word for word and it is, you got any whiskey? How about you give me a glass of whiskey? So you yes. almost perfectly nailed it. Yes. And how about you give me a glass of whiskey? And that's when she does the wolf thing. Now it's at that moment when she sees him for what he is. And there's all this like the premonition that you mentioned the uh, the liquor store about the wolf is right. when this this drives home and she just wants it to be clear that don't let this get in the way this isn't johnny this is just something that happened it's an accident he realizes that this is the first woman who's ever understood this and he decides for all immediately for all the wrong reasons that he's going to grab her and he's going to kiss her and it's about what he wants to do to his brother and she specifically says, take it out on me. Yes. <laughs> Fuck. And then another line that was so that was so golden. To the bed. That was so golden. I had to, I, I rerun it and I wrote it down. She says, leave nothing but the skin over my bones. <laughs> it's like, fuck. Yes. Yes. And it's all this, and it's under the poster of La Bohème. So it's got this dramatic flair to it where she's talking about the wolf. And at one point in that whole scene, He's got, he puts the music on, he's got the music on the opera and it's showing the winter scene. And then when, and then the drama of her, of she says, wait a minute. And she slaps him and then she grabs him and kisses him. And he says, where are you taking me? And he says, to the bed. And she says, to the bed, to the bed. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And then 
they proceed to hump with their clothes on, which it's a PG movie. And the adults know what's really going on. It's just the early, it's the early 80s, portion of the evening. 80s PG movies. <laughs> and then there's your favorite scene of the dinner, the dinner party. In the brownstone, right. In the brownstone. And the old man keeps taking his plate to go feed his 11 dogs, dogs or whatever they are. <laughs> and at first they just say, oh, my husband's going to need another plate. And, then, and, and the aunt... The, 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 whatever her character's name is, she looks, she says, looks at the plate and says, oh, okay, like, whatever. <laughs> what happened <laughs> to the last plate I passed you? And then he, he bends down a hand to her and she says, old man, if you feed those dogs any more of my food, I'm going to kick you till you're dead. And also the dinner party is where we start to create this mythos of the full moon yes. igni igniting love. Cosmos, because moon. Because whatever, the, fact, the, the brother-in-law starts talking about how his story was forgettable, but it was about how he had a dream where the moon was so bright and then Cosmo was there and he got angry at Cosmo, even though it was a dream and blah, blah, blah. That he, that he made the moon come down and scare him. The reason that scene, though, is memorable in my view is because it is the the premonition of the scene in the bedroom where he sees yes. it again yes. and he gets all randy Indeed. With, with his wife. And then the next day, there he's singing and laughing because he's been yes. late for the first time in 15 years, same as her. But Loretta sees that too. Yeah, that and she does. And, and at the end of the day, the story is about, obviously about relationships, particularly about married relationships and the married, will be married, soon will be married, whatever. Right. But the configurations with Cosmo and what the fuck is Olympia Dukakis' character's name? God damn it. I will tell you. Rose. Rose, of course. The freaking daughter's middle name. And, but... Yes. And w another quote that I wrote down was after the meal, when, when Rose <laughs> comes into the bedroom and finds Cosmo there all passed out, she says, you drank too much and you'll sleep too hard and then you'll be up when you should be down. <laughs> Which I love. Uh, he drinks too much and then he goes, listen to those Vicky car records and then he comes back and he doesn't touch me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So then the, when when Nicolas Cage leaves the, when Ronnie leaves Loretta's apartment after they wake up, and of course because it's, it's not a Loretta's apartment, that's his. It's his apartment, yeah. Because it's a PG movie, they do that thing where each one of them takes a sheet off the bed when they get up to yeah. cover themselves, whatever. TV, and he he declares his love for her, and she's in that case you can't come to the she wedding. She slaps him. That's when she slaps him. Yeah, she's like again. Yeah, it's on. Snap out of it. And then he makes that proposal of look. My two favorite things in yeah, life are right. opera and I guess you. And would you come out for one night? Sort of, then I guess. <laughs> I forget what the two things are. I like the opera and I like you, so no. So if you're not doing anything tonight, and she agrees, but then the extreme lengths that she goes to get all dolled up, uh, yeah, belie her. Actual it's feelings. the only date she's had since. It's the only date like this she's ever had. She's never right. been to the opera. She never spends a penny on herself. And she does that thing. She where, hates her life. Yeah. And that scene that you mentioned before where she's where she's sipping wine, wine in front of the fireplace right. with a sexy, sexy saxophone playing and right. she's choosing high heels and a dress. It's, it felt very 80s. Yeah, and but what's interesting about, and I look at that scene because one of the things that I've always wondered about is that Cher's acting chops is shown in this movie, the movie Mask, and the other one that she starred in, Mermaids. Her acting... Was, and I like her, so I don't have any of the prejudice that you start with. But that, but I don't think that independent. That what I'm about to say is independent. Of that she, her acting is incredible. Yes, and incredible. And what always was curious to me as to why she did so few movies. I agree. She could have totally pivoted to being a movie star. Although the same would might be said about Lady Gaga, who would tell you, <sighs> "Man, when I, I got a tour." <laughs> yeah. I got a tour. I'm not you yeah. know, switching here to, it's like, you're never going to make the kind of money. I don't think, I don't know. Do you make the kind of money movies that you make touring? Way more, I would think. Movies? Do. Way more movies. If it's a hit, but that's, if it's not, it just takes a lot of time and you don't get paid that much. I don't think touring is that profitable. Oh, I do. Okay. But anyway. Join us live for our next episode at the <laughs> Soho Theater. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the other scene that, that, that I loved was the scene in the church. 
Yes, where, yes, where it's her and her mother. You, you can tell it if you'd like. No, go ahead. Yeah, it's her and her mother, Olympia Dukakis, and Rose, Olympia, says, Cosmo's cheating on me. And it's it takes Cher by surprise. She's like, what? The heck? You, you must be mistaken. How could that be? He's too old, she says. And Olympia says, a wife knows. A wife knows. Which is a wife knows. one of the... And when she knew, of course, was the reason she snapped at the old man and said she was going to kick him till she dead because it was at that moment just before that that she realized that her husband was cheating on her. Cosmo, why are you drinking so much wine? Why? What's wrong with you? I don't want to talk about it. That scene, that's the biting of the old man's head off was precipitated by that moment, her knowledge. She shows that the wine is related to cheating. In what way? Cosmo was drinking so much wine at the dinner right. that she said to him, he kept saying to the couple, I, I don't want to talk about it. And she, and he says, and he's pouring wine and drinking it down. And she says, Cosmo, why are you drinking so much wine? Right. What's wrong with you? And he says, I don't want to talk about it. The look on her face was that was the moment she realized he was cheating on her. And then she bit the old man's head off. Huh. The hmm. scene in the church was the, was what happened maybe the next day. Yeah. And that was super like that scene was important to the movie, I think. What's interesting about this movie is too, is that besides the characters that we've spoken about, which are pretty much the speaking parts, there wasn't anybody else in the movie that we'll remember or talk about. Yeah. Like there were in that way, it felt know, like a play. There, yes. There, there, ensemble there, cast. there were no, but there were no scenes that were outside really there. The old man took his dogs out to try and entice them to hell at the super fake moon, moon over the twin towers. And Bella moon. Luna. Luna. Bella Luna. Bella Luna. And then he said, how, how, how? And then the dogs. Arroo, arroo, yeah. arroo. That was, I don't know. How about the scene where the old man with the dogs runs into Rose and the professor and sees them holding arm in arm? Yes, Rose because and that, the that's professor. after she knows that Cosmo is cheating on her. And yes. Is like, Which is the second thing she did. She right. went out to dinner by herself. She had dinner with the dude. And she went to church. First she went to church. Yeah. The day she went to church, that night she went to dinner. Right. This all takes place. The other thing about this movie is that it's one of those movies that takes place over a certain number of days. And it's not real time, obviously, because it's three days. It, the whole thing took how many days? The whole movie? I think a week. Three, three or four or a week. No, yeah. more than that. So that leads me in and out of Italy. Yeah. A right. week. That leads me to, a, to another complaint, super pedantic complaint, is that the moon doesn't stay full for a week. No. I'm sorry. No, no, it's this, not that big either. Right? This whole movie is based on a lie, and <laughs> it's it's <laughs> it's funny. I mean that it's a Hollywood movie. I mean where it's realistic and you love this piece of but but in so many ways you just gotta suspend belief. It's They're like it's the a, size of the moon. It is a play. the The backdrops are stage backdrops. The moon, uh, for example. Yeah, like I think door fronts. If this wasn't if this wasn't originally written as a play, it could totally play as a play be a play because you could totally do that do it man well have I, at it i'll start my um, i'll start it i'll my play, play, I'll play cosmo <laughs> i think we all know you're the old man with the dogs <laughs> Balloon. so i don't know nicholas cage is just such a doofus like i don't like his character he's just like so like a well i guess yeah whatever man like yeah he's that's he's he, raising arizona he, he's like that whatever doofus. he hits him which isn't, I think Cher's character is the most intelligent in the movie. And yes, his, way he's, he's not so much a doofus as he is a, what's the word I want to use? He's a romantic, passionate. He's, he's just, he's unsophisticated. Baker. Unsophisticated. He's a romantic baker. He's a blue collar, emotional, probably not a real high IQ. <laughs> Hard on his sleeve, if he ever wore sleeves. Yes. And so anyway, they, so they meet up at the Met Opera House, which I briefly looked up on on Google Maps, and it's like, yeah, that looks like the Met Opera House. First, I went to the Met, which is the Met Art Gallery, which is not where they went. And also, I found there are articles on the internet of, so you're going to New York City, go to all these places that are famous in romantic comedies. Okay, whatever. And the, the move where they meet up at the fountain, and he goes to kiss her, and she's like, no, I didn't say there were gonna there was gonna be kissing. I thought that was. Uh, an interesting choice and clever yeah. and classy. Well, she was still trying to maintain the, her perception of morality of, of 
that was a one night thing. That's all it was going to be. It wasn't going to happen again. And, and she was sure of it when she told him, slapped him and said, get over it. And then he won it. And then she slapped him again. She was, that was with conviction. So she does. But then on the way home, as she's kicking the can up the street in the full moon, which somehow is still shining four days later, as you point out, she's bemused and obviously uh, just loved the evening. Yep. Presumably is falling in love with him, but that's not totally clear. It's just, that it's interesting that it's clear that how much he is smitten with her and you're not quite sure about whether she's more smitten with the romance of it as opposed to the man. Right. And so when they go back and he's trying to convince her to go inside to his apartment or her apartment, I forget, after they've gone to the to the opera, he says, only God can point the finger, Loretta, yeah. <laughs> which I love. And then he says, I want you in my bed. I don't care if I burn in hell. <laughs> And then he looks up at the sky and says, the stars are perfect. Not perfect. 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 And then they cut from them going up to bed to like these tunnel lights of the airplane. Of she goes Johnny, and then she walks home in the morning. Yes. Of Johnny's plane arriving, which right. I thought was just well and done. The extra gag about the luggage showing just that he's every, he's just a fucking, he's, he's one just mishap dumbs. after another. He's yes. just a stumble bumps. He's a what? Stumble thumbs. Stumble thumbs. Okay. It's good to know. Look it Stump, up. Stumble thumbs. No, I <laughs> never heard that before, but I agree that should be a word and I hope that it is. Okay. So they what's the deal? First of all, I wasn't sure what the hell they were doing, but then I looked it up and apparently they are every time they have champagne, they're putting in sugar cubes. Sugar. Have you done it, that? It, it, the, the deal with it back in the day was that it enhanced the uh, alcoholic effect of the stuff. Certainly made the champagne sweeter, but that's I was aware of that cocktail factor, that cocktail or eccentricity. Answer my question. Have you done that? Oh, with champagne? No, I haven't eaten cane sugar. And... No, but I understood what it was. Yeah, okay. That's all okay. I'm saying. Okay. Next question. So then they Johnny comes home, and at this point, I'm going off my memory from last week. Johnny comes home, and they are all in the lovely brownstone kitchen all just having breakfast together and johnny announces first that the wedding is off i forget why because his mother didn't die it's a miracle <laughs> so this miracle of my, of my mother not dying must mean that marrying you would be bad luck that's right that's right okay. and that's right. luckily as we discussed in your honor finale where everything just ties up nicely then you know, Loretta and Ronnie say, well, actually, that works out well for us because we're in love and we're getting married. And I think he I borrowed a ring or something. He proposed to her. Yeah. John, Ronnie proposed to her on the spot. Johnny gives the ring to his brother or something. No, she, one of the reasons that Johnny is there is not only to tell Loretta what he thinks is the bad news, but to get his ring back. <laughs> right. To get his ring back. And then he has to give the ring up to Ronnie who asked for it because when he proposes, she says, where's the ring? No ring. It's bad luck. And Johnny looks at his brother and says, Johnny, give me the ring. And Johnny, of course, obeys him because he's completely, he doesn't understand what's just happened. <laughs> of course he doesn't. How could he? Yeah. Yeah. And then they do this thing at the end where they pan towards this portrait. Of the Italian Italian immigrants are great there. It would be the parents or it could be the old man with the dogs when he was heavy and round because the man in the picture doesn't look like the old man. Right. But it could be the grandparents of Rose's side of the family because that's her father-in-law, not her father. That's Cosmo's right. dad. Yes. So the image we saw very likely was Rose's parents who would have been the brother or sister of, of the couple who runs the grocery store. You could tell me those names too. It would relieve me, but... It's too bad. I've seen it so many fucking times. I can't remember their names. I don't know the grocery store people, but the the guy that played the old man outlived a lot of the other actors. Really? He so the old man died in let's see nineteen ninety two, and so did Cosmo, like a couple weeks James after. James Gardenia, Vincent Gardenia, Vincent Gardenia, and about a perfect role for him. He was in a lot of good stuff. He he had a look about him. 
And I, he don't, had a, I don't know him as an actor. Like I, I see his face. Maybe age, like you're not in the age when you would. This is back in the day. This is probably 60s, 70s. You look at his film career, probably. Uh, There's a lot of 70s and 60s. Yes, yes. Memorandum yeah, first. A character actor, and so this was a turn of comedy that he didn't often do. He was a serious actor, mostly in dramas, and he played he played some bad guys too. I remember because he had a very convincing, aggressive way about him. I can you see know, him being like a bulldog. Yes, it's like a, bulldog. a yeah, like a gangster sort of guy. So Olympia Dukakis was her big claim to fame was what was it White Magnolias that was shot in uh, the town in Louisiana, Natchitoches, where Nikki and I spent a lot of time, and uh, we're in the neighborhoods where the movie uh, Steel Magnolias, Steel Magnolias, White yes. Magnolias was shot with Julia Roberts, which was one of her takeoff roles after she yes, was in Mystic that. Pizza, which was her her big break. And who are the other women in it? Jane, not Jane Fonda. I wonder who, what's, of course, Dolly Parton was the hairdresser. Then a lot of the movie revolved around her place of business. Sally Field, uh, Shirley MacLaine, Derek Sally Hanna. Field, Shirley, yes. 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 Incredible. But that town was a cool little, is a cool little town. But if you look up the, the name Natchitoches as a town in Louisiana, you'd have to spell it. In order to spell it correctly, you would have to mispronounce it. Nacogdoches, because that's the way it's spelled. And it's quite a long name of a town. And because I am driving into a strange town, I want to be able to pronounce it correctly. So I'm asking Google how to pronounce it. And they're coming back and fucking Google's pronouncing it Nacogdoches. So I'm repeating that out loud in the car. And when I get to the first place where for some reason I have a sentence that must include the name of the town, I say Nacogdoches, and it makes the person just burst out laughing and says, well, you I, ain't from... No, I think Nacogdoches is correct. The way it should, the way it looks like it's pronounced is Nacogdoches, Nacogdoches. Well, and that pronunciation is what I heard in the radio, but the right. way it's pronounced in Louisiana is Nacogdoches. Right. And it's like Smittix, which is what I'm drinking. It doesn't Indeed. matter that Smittix, it's not Smittix, it's Smithwicks, but that's the way you pronounce it. So uh, would you believe that in Texas... There's a town that is pronounced Nacogdoches. Yes, I do know that. Which is I, spelled Nacogdoches, which... I do know that. Interesting. There's a little bar in uh, Nacogdoches that's called uh, Papa's Blues Bar, I believe is the name of it. And it's in between two restaurants that this family owns. One is called Papa's, and the other one is called Mama's is an Italian restaurant. And Papa's is burgers and, and sausage and, and a little faster food. Mama's is also a bar. There's got to be a place so, somewhere in the world that it's Papa's Tapas. What uh, do you think? Pop, Papa's Tapas. I would think. Uh, hey, you could do that. Hey. Run it out of your apartment building. Hey. I thought about the shed I built. Here's what I thought. So I built a shed. And about the window that I took out from the original building and moved and put so that it now opens top to bottom. All four of our listeners are totally 14. aware of that. Yes. There's 14 of them. I just well, checked. Okay. And uh, so anyway, you open the window, latch it to the ceiling of the shed. So there's plenty of room. It's a big window, four by four. And I got a little hot stove there, a little gas flame three burner that I have that I take camping. And you hook it up to a big old canister gas, turn it on. And I'm going to make sandwiches. I'm going to make pressed and grilled sandwiches. And I'm going to put a sign out in the front. And people will come from all over and line up to get my sandwiches. What do you think? This is this could happen. This there's a lot of ideas that I have that really, to be honest, ain't gonna happen. This I'm, one could happen. I've got the setup. I'm glad that you've reached the maturity of a lemonade stand. As a, it's as a little a more than that now. Now to be fair, a lemonade stand doesn't have a window that you open up and latch to the ceiling of a shed. You're right. That's pretty bitching. This and here's the level. other thing you need to know. Do you have do you have approval from the authorities? To listen, listen. What's your employee ID? What I'm doing when the authorities see what I'm doing, there's only one thing they're going to say to me: "Give me one of them fucking sandwiches." Or else, we're going. No, they won't threaten. They just know they're salivating. But here's the other thing you need to know: when you open that window, and you're looking out of it from the inside, you're right at head height to the top of the window. When you're outside, you're below it. So just like a food truck, right? The patrons are standing low, and there's a ledge where they would. There's a ledge already there where they would hand over their dollars. And so you just make these sandwiches for five bucks 
and no matter what you make, it's five bucks. And the first thing you do in the first week that you do it, you actually spend five bucks a sandwich, right? So that everybody is Burning crazy with it. Yep. And slowly but surely, you'll cut it down to something a little bit more reasonable. But you want the thing is, if you're selling like, you want to launch a business at a loss or almost. Do you and, want to launch it? It's a lead loss. It's a loss leader is actually what it's. What or a leader loss, yes. A leader who loses it. So If you, if you really about, had to pee, you could lose a leader. Let's talk a second about the two, the two Onion articles that you said. I just pulled one of them up. I just pulled one of them up as you were talking. This is, so what I love about the Onion is they're, I almost more appreciate the Onion when they are cutting my team. Yeah. Like they did... Uh, they did a mockery of like the Raleigh, North Carolina bar scene one time that was just brutal. And I was there for it, even though like they were discussing places that I knew. So here's the Onion article headline, and this will be in the show notes at happier.fm slash one zero zero one hundred. So the headline is Biden comforts families of Syrian airstrike victims with eloquent speech on living with heartbreaking loss. Uh, it's here's, it's done. It's done. Heads up. It's done straight up. What act, he says. Acting in his official, acting in his unofficial role as consoler in chief, President Biden took some time Friday to comfort the families of those lost in yesterday's airstrike with an eloquent speech on the challenges of living with heartbreaking loss. Uh, Take it from me, well, folks. I know how difficult it is to have those you most love taken from you and suddenly and without warning, says Biden. <laughs> it's it's so fucking perfect because. Uh, it's so easy to make fun of Trump, right? Yeah. It, that was just like shooting fish in a fucking barrel with no water. Uh, <laughs> but to take any foreign attack of Biden's Joe. and turn it around on him. You just feel bad. You just, you just feel bad. But so, it's so good. This, is, this, was, this story broke the news to me about the airstrikes. I did not know that we really? were attacking anywhere. There was another, there was another attack today where, of a reactive attack from Iran to kill one of our contractors. Yeah. See. So there was. They were. They wanted to make sure that they struck back in a way that didn't cause an escalation. And <laughs> uh oh, they didn't quite see it that way, Joe. And oh, by the way, Joe, you decided not to talk to Congress first, just like Trump did. Is that true, Joe? And, and the that, answer is, yeah, yeah, pretty much. They didn't even talk to the gang of eight. Not. I don't like it. I don't like it. And the whole journalist assassination thing by the Saudis. Khashoggi, oh my God. It's like- Just, oh, you got- But, but we knew we were electing a softy, I will compromise at anything person when we voted for- ask you this question. Why did they release the report? Why did Biden's team release the report that ended up telling us what we already knew in no more provable or demonstrable way than what we knew them because the report could not give away potential sources and resources. So the report actually just told us what we already knew without any further proof that what we knew was actually true. Why right. did they release the report if, as a result of releasing the report, all Biden would say is, oh, why did they release it? I have an answer for you. The appearance of transparency. No, it was a mistake. Then why won't Biden, why won't Biden release his, his virtual log of, of visitors to the White House? He has a virtual Another log. You don't, pardon? No, I have been checked out of politics. For oh, anyway, I you, you wanted me to report on CPAC. Which is why I named you our official CPAC correspondent. So the uh, thing da, 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 going directly da, on the floor da, da, of CPAC. Da, 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 this just in. Dennis, so reporting here's a live. Couple of images. Here's a couple of images. Number one, here's Donald Trump Jr. with his uh, sport coat that's still exactly two sizes too small for him with his chest puffed up and saying that it isn't CPAC. And then to make sure that people understood what he meant, he formed the letter T with his two hands and said it's called TPAC, meaning, of course, Trump Pack. And he pointed to the golden statue of like, Trump, like two packs which of oddly enough is a golden statue, like the proverbial golden beast of the, the biblical days, the calf. And but he and he has on a he has on a sport coat and he has a shirt and a tie on. The tie, I believe, is red, is white and blue or white and red or whatever. But he inexplicably has on a pair of boxing shorts that are the American flag. 
The statue does. The, the golden statue, the, the proverbial golden cat. I mean, that's what so I wear as every day. Donald Trump is saying, it's TPAC, and there's the golden statue. Row your drums because they're going to do a straw poll of what percentage of the people here want different people supported or they would choose for the next presidential because the, election. Because the C stands for conservative? Donald Trump, pardon? The first C stands for conservative? Conservative Political Action Council. Com- committee, yeah, com- council, okay. CPAC. Okay. So listed as Donald Trump, listed as Ron DeSantis, the idiot governor from Florida. Listed is Hawley, who is the insurrectionist on January 6th, and his co-conspirator Ted Cruz is there as well. And maybe Pompeo is there as well. He came back from Mexico. That's nice. Huh? That's He's a little, he, he got mad, tan. erupted. It was bad. And Vicky, or not Vicky, but Nikki, Nikki Haley. And uh, drum roll, TPAC, drum roll. What percentage did Donald Trump get of the vote? 37. No. 55. That was close. What do you think that he had expected? A hundred. When T when Donald Trump called it TPAC, what did you think he thought the straw poll was going to be? 92, 93%? Trump yeah. got fucking flummoxed. DeSantis got 23%, for Christ's sake, and he's a fucking idiot. All those other guys drew off fucking points to the point where, what could say this, nearly half of the participants in CPAC did not think Donald Trump should be the next candidate. This was extraordinary news against Trump. See, this is where Trump and... Putin and I agree that voting is just bullshit. Like, w- we three know what's best for the people, and we should just, why should we let people vote? All these candidates drawing votes away. Oh, I know. What the it's fuck? All, they like, spend what? all this money. Just tell us who you want. And I don't know. The, the only report I heard from CPAC was that when Trump gave his speech, which was apparently like a thousand hours long, and, yeah, and super, super boring. But the main takeaway I heard was that he was scarily mm, fit or full of energy or oh. not dying <laughs> in a way that he, many of us had hoped that it looks like he's been resting. It, it actually is not anything different from anything we ever saw. His high level of energy his self is his self love his his narcissism and How can he the do same that? speech the same speeches right and Stephen Miller was brought back by Trump to help him write the speech it was like let's get the band back together again and so they put it together and it's not any different than what it was before and it, where does that energy come from do you know anyone that's that age and that and with that lifestyle let me ask you this that when is you think that- about a villain character right in comic books or whatever. I don't know if you're fishing out, probably not um, superheroes, but you think about villains. What happens to villains when they grow older? What happens to bad guys when they get older? They get worse and worse and worse and more and more powerful and more and more powerful. So when they're 60s, their 70s, their 80s, they're all wielding old grizzly fucking gnarled. And you look at the scripts that then have that guy who's filthy rich get a secret for a long, longer life, eternal life. Forever. And so that's that's what I'd say about that. Shit. I hope we don't live in that comic book world. I but. do. You want to see an interesting movie? Did you see Glass? That's Samuel the Jackson. Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, yes. I have Bruce Willis. That. Bruce Willis, yes. That's a fantastic uh, movie. That's I've seen that, plot. but I don't recall all of the nuances to it. But so Samuel L. Jackson believes that the, the superheroes exist, and so he scours research for over 30 years of his life as a, as a person who's got glass bones and finds a guy, Bruce Willis, who somehow has survived two cataclysmic accidents, train accidents plane crash yes, yes. and a train and, and, and lives through it and yes. believes that he's found a real superhero. But then, yeah. Okay. I, yes, I recall most of that plot. I think that's and Bruce uh, Willis and his son in the basement and Bruce Willis testing out whether he's really a superhero because he's never been sick. He's starting to think about what this guy's saying. I've never been sick. I never. And his son puts all the weights on the barbells in the basement. So it's just hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And then he hangs paint cans off the edge. And when he put the paint cans on, since I've been doing, since I've done a lot of painting in my day, I know how heavy a paint can is. (laughs) Carrying two or three of them is a lot of weight. And that was, and he was able to lift it all. So a great plot, a very through the looking glass kind of thing. Anything to Samuel Jackson's. What a, what a career that man has had. Oh my yeah. God. One thing I love about Samuel L. Jackson is in his interviews, he says, look, 
some people refuse to watch movies that they are in, but every time I'm flipping through the channel and I find a movie that I'm in, I fucking stay and I watch it because it's good shit. I'm in good <laughs> shit. He, he's, this is entertaining, which I just, I love about him. I like, if I were an actor, I wish I could say that. And I do enjoy listening to these podcasts that I create. What was the second Onion article? The other one was about Tiger Woods, oh. where it was like, doctors explained to Tiger Woods that you don't have to be all that fit, really, to play golf. That's right. <laughs> Which There's is so true. fat-ass old guys out there who are in <laughs> terrible shape. In fact, you could probably take up smoking. Right. That reminds me, there was a, my, my grandmother used to play with a woman that used to be on the LPGA Tour. And to fit into social golf life, she switched from right-handed golf to left-handed golf. True. And she said, look, just to score similar to these other people at the country club, I'm going to switch hands and play the other way, which raised her handicap from zero to 15 or whatever. Uh-huh. But, but what, what an interesting trick or thing, I guess, if you're ever in a tournament, if, if you're in a tournament, you've got your clubs that you have in your bag. So I got my first shot. Have we talked since? No, we you, didn't. I, I mean, got it the night we spoke. You, you were raising your hand like you had a question, like you were. So I was smarty sore pants for whatever. two days, could have lifted and had a little bit of a tired feeling and then fine got through that my next one is on the 16th we'll be doing our podcast on a tuesday uh, that week or a tuesday i would say tuesday tuesday uh, tuesday 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 hey that reminds me goodbye ruby tuesday who couldn't place a name on you is that stones yeah hmm. is that mm-hmm. why they named the restaurant chain must be actually the story is that's where mick was eating when the song came to him i will fact check that listen to the words goodbye ruby tuesday the sandwich wasn't all that good the salad bar had wilted lettuce get me out the front door that's not my fetish yes (laughs) i'm a man uh, As the sun slowly sets over the warm Kalamazoo, we had a 50 to 52 degree shift in uh, two days of our weather here. Fucking hey. From uh, below zero to uh, plus 45. 54 <laughs> degrees. It was minus nine. Nine is, nine, nine is mine. Minus nine. Nine, nine is, is mine. Did you, get the, you got all the pictures I sent you. Okay. Okay. Here's another fucking rant I want to go on briefly. You sent me these pictures, and for some reason, I guess your phone... You send me these pictures that are like eight or nine megabytes. But they're big fucking pictures, which I love. I want to see every little pixel that you take. But Google has told me, hey, your Gmail account is full. And if you want if you want to keep receiving email, you need to either delete a bunch of shit or pay us something stupid like $2.00 a year or some bullshit like it's stupid and so i go and i say clearly i would rather not delete dennis's lovely snow pictures i want to pay you two dollars a year and google says okay so enter in your credit card here and i put in my credit card and i say pay and they say an error has occurred this does not work and i've tried it with every single credit card i've tried it with Uh, paypal i've tried it with all the possible ways that they will let me pay and google will not let me pay for more storage that's weird that Google... It's weird that such an enormous company would right. stymie me from or giving them money. them, giving them money. However... That is crazy. It is... I'm not... This is not their choke point where they're losing the most money. Right. There are other people that are paying them millions of dollars. I, and I'm not one of those people. But there are millions of people like me that want to pay them two dollars. Two and why the fuck not? Anyway, I went to do it... I sorted all my Gmail by, by attachment size. And your pictures of late of your... We're big. We're, we're the Got to put them on a thumb drive, man. That's the latest technology, yes, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, write it right into a... De- I should have checked myself on that before I was telling you something <laughs> about IT. <laughs> hey, man, did you hear they got these really little computers now that you can hold in your hand? What? <laughs> Like calculators? Yeah, I got to go, bro. This I love you, fun. man. I love Thousand you. Hey, episodes. I'm a- 100. Hey, this is, why I, this is why I started numbering these motherfuckers at 001, because I uh, knew we were going to need three digits. We did it. And 
another 900 episodes from now if we need another digit then yeah. fuck it we just add it we could do it now if you want to think ahead a little bit well, fuck it we'll do it live fuck it there you have it we did it 100 episodes you can find the show notes for this episode at happyhour.fm slash 100 you can help support the show by going to patreon.com slash happyhour we would love that and thank you to all of you who have stayed with us for these 100 episodes. Uh, it's been a blast. And I finally saw Moonstruck. And we will see you next week.